I first uh, was following Dave's uh, eloquence on the question when he was organizing a thing called uh, After Downing Street, right? On the Downing Street memos and trying to get into people's heads the revelation, of course, that uh, at a time when uh, our president, George W. Bush, was saying that uh, he was heading, uh, there, he was not heading toward war, he wanted to negotiate, uh, that in fact the decision had long been made to go to war and to fix the facts around that. And uh, we learned that from a leak in Britain uh, about a conversation between uh, Blair, I guess it was, and no, no, actually it was, a, it, was a, it was a briefing of Blair, if I recall, you, you correct me here, by uh, conversations that had been held in Washington from Richard Dearlove, was it, the, uh, the head of intelligence there, and uh, some of our people here saying that the decision had been made for war. The point is, uh, I was just about to make, these were, this was a description, a memo to the British secret uh, of conversations in the U.S. Obviously, there were corresponding memoranda of conversation in the U.S. These were conversations that were in the U.S. We have never gotten a line of those, am I mistaken? Uh, no one has leaked those, isn't that right? But, yeah, that's right. And and for the, the U.S. newspapers were saying that Dear Love had probably picked up what he reported to Blair and his cabinet at, you know, cocktail parties in Washington, D.C. In fact, he had a lengthy private meeting with George Tenet, and it was on that meeting with Tenet, the head of U.S. so-called intelligence, that the head of British so-called intelligence was reporting yeah. to Blair uh, that the U.S. had decided to go to war and was going to fudge the facts to fit going to war, which we now know from numerous sources even more authoritative that kept coming out for months and months. And the British have done endless, you know, committees and reports and investigations. Their latest, you know, Chilcot inquiry is going to be published July 6th, unless they delay it again. Uh, why they couldn't make July 4th, I don't know. That would have been, you know, perfect. But but they were bit players. They were accomplices. Uh, and the chief architects of that crime are playing golf, teaching college, uh, retiring, you know, they're roaming the world free. Well, I was just drawing attention to the fact that Britain, with its official Secrets Act, by the way, which we don't have officially, uh, Obama has been using the Espionage Act, as was first done by Richard Nixon against me uh, some years ago. Obama has used that unconstitutionally, I would say, more often than any other president, in fact, three times more than all of our presidents together. But despite that, the British Official Secrets Act, which is explicit, criminalizing any revelation of secret, uh, they had not only got a leak on the Downing Street memos, uh, but have had these investigations, which have brought out a lot of classified information. There has been no comparable hearing of any kind about the decision making that got us into Iraq. And uh, in other words, we do not have the Pentagon Papers of Iraq yet, and uh, if we ever will. So at any rate, uh, David was uh, very, very good at publicizing that, and then he got very uh, involved. I was following him on the impeachment issue of Bush and Cheney. Certainly no officials in our government have ever deserved impeachment as much as, or more than, more than in any case, Bush or Cheney. I... <clears throat> Uh, I had reservations at the time about focusing only on Bush. I'm not, I can't remember if you did that or not, or if we had an argument about that. I said, you know, he does have impeachment insurance here, you know, in the form of Cheney uh, that we would get. And surely you have to go against both of them together if possible. You worked for Kucinich, and I was with Kucinich when he announced in Washington uh, at his press conference, his resolution to impeach Cheney, which I thought was very clever, not that, uh, uh, because who could be against that, impeaching? <laughs> well, I'll tell you who was against it. We had a meeting uh, with the Congress members who were most on board, and Maxine Waters from California said, let's do Cheney first. We'll do Cheney first. Mm -hmm. it, it's nonsensical, but it's what the public will go for. Let's do Cheney first. And Barbara Lee, also from California, said, nope, let's ask John Conyers. Well, when you go ask John Conyers, you flush everything down the drain, and that was the end of that. Uh, and it was you know, years later uh, that Dennis Kucinich said, well, I'm going to introduce it anyway, you know. So. Okay, since you've raised that, let me ask you, uh, 
here, Dave. Uh, when when exactly would that conversation have gone? Where Barbara Lee said that? You, you what, think I have a memory that I don't? Um, well, let me let me refresh you. Would it have been uh, after uh, or before I, 2006? Before I, I, the uh, change in Congress? I think it was 2005. I, I, it, w it was certainly 2005 See, there's, because... There's, there's something funny about that, I'll just say. Uh, Conyers, it, it doesn't in the end reflect well on the Democrats or on Congress specifically, but Conyers wrote a book in, I think, uh, this would be a problem, I think 2005. At any rate, he wrote a book for the impeachment of Bush or uh, with the articles of impeachment for Bush. And he said, well, if I get to be, if I get to be a chairman of, yeah, I remember now, well, if I get to be chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, the first thing I will do is impeach uh, Bush. And he had a whole uh, whole book on that. And then my understanding, and I was in the position of, well, I'll just say berating Conyers about this you know, the later in front of a lot of others. It was a tense moment, really. But his aides told me, that what had happened was that he did intend to impeach Bush. And that when he got, and it really, I must say that I was very much, uh, had very great hopes for a change in Congress in favor of the Democrats in 2006, because it would make John Conyers head of the Judiciary Committee uh, with this in mind uh, and, and other things. And uh, my understanding is that right after that election, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, came to Conyers and this was from an eyewitness, uh, one of Conyers' aides who was in the room, who said that our Nancy Pelosi here in San Francisco fixed uh, Conyers with what this aide described as the most steely gaze I have ever seen on someone and said, there will be no impeachment proceeding. And I said, well, what did Conyers say? And he said, he didn't say anything. He just, you know, he, he took that. And the, 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 the point of it was, it turned out, was that uh, I thought we'd get a lot out of uh, out of a Democratic Congress in 2006. I, I mean, I had hopes at that point, and I was disillusioned because they said, okay, if we make an impeachment issue in 2006, that will bring Republicans to the polls in 2008 uh, on the impeachment issue. That will motivate them, you know, and mobilize them, and we won't get a Democratic president in 2008. And Conyers was in particular under the gun there. Uh, I think this was, I was hearing this conversation later. It was a conversation about what had happened at the time, but I was hearing it uh, really just before the election. And Obama was, uh, I'm not sure had become the candidate yet, but he was a strong competitor at that point. And Conyers was not about to be accused of having ruined it for the first black candidate uh, you know, on this. So he laid back on the issue, no question. And um, obviously the argument you know, on him uh, was not trivial, it was, it was a significant argument, but that was the time to impeach and uh, it was, a mis was bad not to. I mean, is that against your understanding of things? Uh, not for the most part. Uh, if I could just add, I, I think that there was an enormous public demand for impeachment that was generated by activism and in part generated by the 2005 pretense of the Democrats that if they had the majority, they would end the war and impeach the people who started it. Yeah. And it even got to the point where you had a majority in U.S. polls in favor of impeachment without Congress having said one word about impeaching anybody, which was unheard of. It was unprecedented for that support to precede any action. Uh, but what happened in 06 when the Democrats won the majority and every exit poll, not a single one of which asked about impeachment, Every exit poll found the number one reason why people voted to give the Democrats the majorities in Congress was to end the Iraq war. And the Washington Post went and talked to Rahm Emanuel, who was running the Democrats in the House in January after the election, and said, so are you going to end the Iraq war? And Rahm Emanuel said, no, we're going to keep it around so that we can run against it again in 2008. It worked so well. Right. So this is I mean, if you there, there's all this news now about the party platform and how important it is to r get progressives writing the party platform for the Democrats. If you go back and read the 08 platform and the and the the. Uh, 
the 12 platform, 2012 platform, you know, the, the things that they never bothered to try and are given up on and have forsaken disappeared, but the stuff that they were going to try and they still want to pretend they're going to try just gets carried over to the next platform. Well, this is what the Democrats wanted to do for 08. So it's not only that they went against the public and their own political interests by and their constitutional duties by refusing to impeach, they also went against the mandate of the 06 election and law and morality uh, in escalating a war rather than ending it. And, you know, most of us, you know, I can't say everyone, and this is why that movement grew so energetically and rapidly, but most of us didn't want to impeach George W. Bush because we hated him or disliked him or wanted vengeance and retribution against him or disliked the Republicans and wanted to run a campaign ad for the Democrats. We wanted to deny the next person the powers that Bush had accumulated along with his predecessors in the office. And we knew that if there were no consequences for all of those abuses of power, they would be continued by the next person of whatever race, gender, party, creed, ideology. And they have been. So that, yes, Obama has prosecuted more whistleblowers than any of his predecessors. But when it comes to people in power committing crimes and abuses, he has taken the policy of looking forward, which means ignoring crime, which he has now applied to Harry Truman as well. We will look forward. I won't mention what was actually involved in bombing your city, people of Hiroshima. Uh, and that has been disastrous so that now – the things that Bush did that were illicit and abusive and criminal uh, and high crimes and misdemeanors are acceptable policy, right? Torture, instead of being a felony to be prosecuted, is a policy choice. And we now have a guy running on, I will escalate torture. Wars, you don't go and lie to Congress and get some sort of permission. You just do them and tell Congress after the fact and the UN as well. Uh, lawless imprisonment, official policy, uh, executive order, uh, understood uh, acceptable U.S. behavior. But you don't lock most people up in prison. You blow them up with missiles along with whoever's driving them or sitting next to them, and 90% of those people are not even the people you're targeting, and the people you're targeting are you know, largely based on who's got their telephone at the moment. And you know it, that sort of stuff is because there was no accountability last time. Right. And when there's no accountability this time, somebody next January is going to have more power than any human being has ever had before in the history of the world. Uh, and their power to spy, their power to abuse, their power to deny rights, their power to murder uh, is going to be completely unchecked, barring some new popular movement of resistance. Uh, and you know, this is, this is because of who we are as a society, right? If, if Obama's drone victims had been white, he would have been impeached in 2010. But if Obama had been a Republican, we would have had an Arab Spring in Washington, D.C. by now. If we learned that a Republican went through a list of men, women, and children on Tuesdays picking which ones to have murdered, there would have been outrage beyond belief. But when I go and talk to Democratic Party organizations, they don't even know it. Right? This is what Orwell said. People will not only excuse whatever their nation does, they will show an incredible ability never to find out about it. <laughs> right? and, and so when you see a headline in the New York Times, Obama has great moral angst over you know, his kill list or something of that sort, and the article has, goes into stuff about Thomas Aquinas before it ever gets to what Obama is doing on Tuesdays. Right? Well, you see that headline and you don't like it, it's uncomfortable, you flip to the sports section and you never find out about it. We, in 2014, we used to go to Obama's, uh, 2012, we used to go to Obama's reelection events to try to protest things that we disagreed with. And we started out protesting the kill list, which he had just advertised in the New York Times. And it was like we were talking about UFOs. People had never heard of it. I mean, the chair of the DNC, you can watch an interview with Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who clearly never heard of it, you know. Uh, and so we protested the war in Afghanistan because people had heard about it. They didn't know it was still going on, but, we, but you could communicate that, you know, but they had heard about it. So that's what we would protest uh, in 2012. You know, uh, you, you really gave me, yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
uh, when I heard you say what could arouse an Arab Spring in D.C., uh, such as the knowledge of the Tuesday, the Tuesday assassination list under Obama, it, it did start me thinking right away, interesting thought, is that maybe that's true. My first thought was, yes, maybe that's true. Let me pose to you, though, that um, George W. Bush did invade a country under absolute false pretenses, and by the time of his second election <coughs> campaign, that was pretty well known. Uh, even even though you know you hadn't gotten the Downing Street memos around that much, uh, it was pretty well understood how we'd been lied into the war and that there were no WMDs to start with, and whatnot. And that wasn't getting. There was no Arab Spring in D.C. In other words, I'm not. I'm not confident he was a Republican uh, president doing that. And uh, I wonder whether whether you're right in saying that there would something would have yeah. really aroused them. I haven't seen what it takes to arouse the public to the kind of thing we saw during Vietnam. Uh, why do you think that is? I'll tell you why. Because it would have been building on the movement that had grown under the George W. Bush administration and been shut down in, in 2007, but was there waiting to be revived. And it was worse in the minds of many people who found out about it and didn't have partisan blinders to be murdering individuals, including American citizens who are that 4% of individuals on earth you're supposed to care about. Uh, it, it looks worse to many people what I'm is sorry, being I, done I with the, the drones than what was being done with the wars. And, you know, there's this whole myth that the resistance to George W. Bush's wars was futile and totally ineffective and a failure, and the war went ahead even though we wanted to prevent it and so forth. I think that's that that's a slanted view, right? I mean, in 2003, public pressure motivated many nations to motivate the United Nations to say no to that war, which made it illegal. We then had the ability to protest a criminal enterprise rather than a humanitarian operation. But they didn't. For, it didn't for happen. For those years that it, followed. It, pardon me. It didn't happen. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a naysayer to uh, cast cold water on the kind of thing I spend my life doing and, you know, lose no opportunity to do to protest these things. But... Uh, and I certainly don't want to discourage people from the protests. On the contrary, I think it's essential, and I don't know what other hope there is. I'm just, uh, yes, I'm just wondering, though, whether it's enough to, to get a Republican in, which is almost what you're saying, if I hear you. Just get a Republican in, then we'd have a movement when they do these things. I Actually, I don't think that will help. Well, I don't see well I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll try to finish telling you what I think the value was in 03, uh, which, which the, making the war illegal did, in I fact, that happen. that was worthwhile, absolutely. Making the war I illegal. Think it was worthwhile, but it didn't have the effect I would hoped it had. Well, it didn't have the effect anybody in this room would have hoped it would have, uh, well, it but have it had effect. a significant it effect, effect, and I'm trying to tell you what it was. If you'll give me like eight more seconds, I'll tell you what it was. In 2013, there was a concerted effort by our current president and his secretary of state and those in power to launch what was going to be a massive bombing campaign of Syria. And our current president admits in the Atlantic uh, magazine some weeks back, what the last thing they ever want to admit, that it was largely public pressure that led him to reverse that decision that he had made and promised to the warmongers in the Senate and so forth. Yeah. And the way that that public pressure worked and the words of numerous Congress members was, I don't want to be that jerk who votes for another Iraq. And the reason that the CIA director coming to Obama and using these exact words, your claim is not a slam dunk, quoting George Tenet's statement in the opposite direction on the WMDs for Iraq, that this is a slam dunk. The reason that was effective, the reason that Obama couldn't go into a new big war on the basis of lies, even though he was already in that war and numerous other ones and would continue it by other means, was because it was too close to Iraq. It was too similar to Iraq to be starting a war on the basis of shaky claims about particular weapons, chemical weapons in this case, and to have the public flooding Congress with more disruption of events, emails, phone calls, letters than anything before in history, the banker bailout or anything else, uh, around the question of should we go into another war on the basis of these claims about weapons. It was too close to Iraq, and the memory was still there. The memory was still there in 2012 when Hillary couldn't win a primary. 
It, this is why we have to keep the memory of war lies alive, because they're not in any textbooks, they're not in any news broadcasts, it's only us to do it. And as they fade, people may win primaries who couldn't four years earlier, right? And the, but the memory uh, in 2013 was huge, and it was all about let's not have another Iraq. This is why the people of, of England were able to get the House of Commons to say no to a prime minister on war for the first time since Yorktown, because it was another Iraq. It, was, it had this big marquee, Iraq Part Two on it. And we had spent a decade making that a badge of shame rather than a badge of honor. And so to say that we didn't accomplish what we wanted, of course not. But to say that we accomplished nothing, right, I mean, is just to get the facts dangerously wrong because it discourages people who rely on knowing about their impact to keep doing what they're doing. They shouldn't. It shouldn't be relevant. We should do what we have a moral responsibility to do, you know, but people rely on that. And so we have to tell them, you know, because the White House won't tell them, you know, even, even though, you know, Obama blurts it out in the Atlantic, you know, people will look away. Peace activists who risked jail over that and other things and put endless effort and energy into preventing that war and prevented it, then started telling each other, oh no, Raytheon didn't want to make any money that week. It was all, it was the Russians' idea, even though that had been on the table forever. And they all admit, including Obama, that that was a second decision after the decision not to do the bombing, to do the chemical weapons uh, out of Syria deal. You know, even peace activists, because it's been beaten into our heads, will say it must have been something else. It couldn't have been me. Right? So it's important for us when it actually is the case, not when we're unsure, not when we're exaggerating, not when we're bragging about what somebody else did, but when it really is the case, to tell each other. Okay. <clears throat> now, thank you. Let's, you had suggested we make this something of a conversation, though I suggested just letting you talk. No, please, uh, if you want to speak to that, please let me, do. Let me comment. Yeah. Uh, first, I agree with everything you just said, of course, as I would hope you, you understood that I did. And you're absolutely right to bring up the 2013 case, and that was a marvelous case of pressure, of public pressure, quite spontaneous. I'm not aware of much organization going behind it. Certainly, I can't claim credit uh, I happen to know in 2013. I didn't foresee that uh, that public pressure arising. It was in between, um, uh, no, what was it? It was when Congress was out of session, as I recall. And people were back home, and they were hearing their, their people talk and saying, as you said, we don't want war in Syria. Now, I do want to just put a couple footnotes in to what you said. As you'll agree, that hadn't happened earlier. It didn't happen under a Republican for eight years. It did happen under a Democrat, as it so happened. And it was a Democratic president who yielded to it and who responded to it. Next question. So it didn't require a Republican either to rise the, the resistance. But when it comes to responding to it, would if, uh, if uh, Romney had been in, wasn't it Romney or was it... Uh, was it? Yeah, Romney. Then. If it had been Romney at that point, would we be at war in Syria or not? I would say with 100% confidence, we would be at war with with Syria. And we are at war with Syria to some extent right now. We are at war. We don't have ground troops in. I think we would have ground troops in with Syria. We do, Dan. Um, what? We do. We have special forces. I know all about that. I mean, th there is a difference. <laughs> the, the military want a lot of ground troops in and a lot in Iraq and a lot in Afghanistan, more than we have. Uh, and, um, and we would have them, I think, with a Republican. And I have to say, I'll, I'll leap right ahead here, uh, I'm not at all confident we won't have them, we wouldn't have them with Hillary Clinton. That's why I think it's of urgent importance to make Bernie Sanders the candidate of our party and, and, and possibly in contrast to you, I don't know, we'll go into, I, this is not the subject uh, I think either of us had planned to get into, but we, we seem to have gotten into it because it does bear on war, uh, which is your subject for sure, and your book. And um, uh, does it make all the difference to have a Democrat in uh, as a Republican? Obviously not. You're absolutely right that he's continued not only the civil liberties uh, depredations here and the violations of the Constitution here under George W. Bush, uh, and we are at war in a number of countries in terms of special forces and drones. All that 
absolutely right. Um, does it make any difference at all? I'll put to you that the 2013 example you're given, I, I really feel quite strongly, and let's think about it, we would not have had that phenomenon had Romney been in. We might or might not have had the public protest. We might have. Uh, indeed. Uh, can you, let's just say I'll, I'll concede that. I do not believe uh, it would have stopped him from either bombing Syria on a massive scale or putting large numbers of ground combat troops into Syria. I think that has made a difference. Uh, I think there would be a big difference between a Bernie Sanders and a Hillary Clinton, uh, let alone a Trump. And I even have to say on, on the issue, uh, I have to say the issue of foreign policy is least clear when it comes to foreign policy between Hillary and Trump. But I would still uh, feel it very important to keep Trump out of office. So I, I do uh, like to see, you were getting into this now, and, and I, th I think you'll disagree, so we'll get into it, <laughs> that, that uh, I would like to see Bernie Sanders make as strong a showing in California as possible. Uh, I even, I even having, having for the first time in my life deregistered as a Democrat, uh, I got tired of being a self-hating Democrat, and I finally, uh, finally uh, changed my registration to no party preference. And then when I was told uh, by somebody, I'm not sure whether it was right or not, that to vote for Bernie in the primary, I had to be a Democrat, I, I quickly now have, uh, some people say no, I've heard it both ways. I, I, I re-registered as a Democrat, temporarily at least, so that I can vote for Bernie, because I would like to see him have as strong an influence on the campaign platform as possible in full recognition that a campaign platform is, does not mean much. But uh, the difference, and there, there will be a difference between the Democrats and the Republican. It doesn't mean what they say. It doesn't mean as much as they should. I have to say, I absolutely do not want to see Trump uh, as, as president on the issue of war, as we're talking about, let alone all the other issues that we know about. So if, if we want to have uh, an argument, trying to focus it, if I may, though, I think we should, in your benefit, and for the benefit of the people here, uh, focus it as much on the war issue as possible, because that's what your book is about. And I want to encourage you to buy this book. It's a terrific book. I find that I reread my copy, what I thought was my copy, marked it all up uh, in the last week in preparation for this, and just learned from David. I had the old edition, not the, not the new edition. And, and he, he, uh, he got me from the back here the second edition, which I haven't seen. And he nicely said, you can give it back to them when you're finished here. Actually, I'm not going to do that, uh, David. <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep this uh, and even ask you to sign it for me uh, before the others. But so I haven't read the new editions, and I'm going to ask you what the difference is and mm -hmm. in general what your book is about. But having read even the old edition, and I have every expectation of the new one, this is a terrific book. Everyone here will want to read this book and have it. Copy. So if you want to tell us, by the way, I don't know if you want to shift or not, or you can, you can go back to answering what I, the controversial and provocative things I just said, or you can answer the question, what does your book have to tell the world? So the, yeah, I, we're doing this in reverse order. I thought we were going to start with the book and then get to everything we're else. Expected to, uh, yeah. The, uh, it, the, the book is, is supposed to be a guidebook to aid people in spotting war lies more quickly, right? So in 01 and in 03, by some polls, you had a majority of Americans wanting war. And in both cases, within a year and a half and ever since, you've had a good majority of Americans, as seen as many polls as have been done, say, we never should have started that war, All right? So there's a chunk of the population that you know would like to be able to spot the problems with wars more quickly, right? Instead of waiting for Freedom of Information Act requests decades later to expose the conscious manipulation by the war mongers and the propagandists, what if we could spot the problem with their case for war immediately and say no? What if we didn't have to wait to uh, you know, in, investigate with the latest technology, the USS Maine uh, in the bottom of Havana Harbor, but we could spot the problem of Spain saying, let's take this to a third party arbitration and settle it nonviolently and we'll comply with whatever the ruling is. And the United States saying, 
hell no, we want a war right now. This is a good excuse for a war. If we could spot the problem immediately, if we didn't have to wait until decades later to say, well, the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident wasn't exactly what they said it was, but we could understand that when US ships are bombing a foreign country, if that country were to shoot back, it's not actually an attack on the United States. Just as today, when a Russian plane flies near a U.S. plane or a U.S. ship in the Baltic, we could look at a globe and say, where is the Baltic? And find out, you know, which coast of the United States it's on. And, <laughs> and, and, and say, here's a problem, right? So, it, it, you know, you, you, go back, you go back through every... I wrote the book because people in 2003 were telling me there was something unique and scandalous that just happened. The U.S. government had lied us into a war. And I knew enough to doubt that. I looked at every past U.S. war, every war I could find abroad. I mean, it, it, the book is very U.S.-centric, and it's, and it's <laughs> targeting the U.S. government, but it includes all kinds of wars from other times and places. And I couldn't find a war that didn't involve similar lies, similar packages of lies to get it going, to keep it going, to escalate it, to beautify it after the fact. Right? And the people in Washington know the value of this. They're building a World War I monument now of all outrages. They've de Obama has declared the Korean War a, a victory of all uh, stupidities. They, they, are, they got a 20-some million dollar program to celebrate and lie about the Vietnam War. Uh, they understand the value of this. And we don't have a big institution pushing back. Not the media, not the textbooks, not the school boards, not, the, not academia, you know, our... our Politics, ethics, philosophy departments are now behind the Catholic Church, which has decided to get rid of the idea that there can be a just war, right? The Pope, who, by the way, is always right. There cannot be a just war. You know, they, the, the Catholic Church is now ahead of U.S. academia, U.S. schools, U.S. politics, U.S. news shows right, on this question. Uh, and, and so we need the ability... So the, so the book doesn't go through each war, which would be endless and repetitive. It goes through types of lies. Is this the type of lie they're using, that the war is defensive? Here's why it isn't. Here's why you can know it isn't. Is it, 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 is, are they lying that it's a war against some sort of infinite evil that can't be dealt with by any other means? Here's why that's nonsense. Is it a, is it a war for, is it, you know, it's become increasingly popular now. It's a humanitarian war. It's a philanthropic war. It's a rescue war. Because this picks up a sliver of the population that had otherwise fallen off, even while they're still using the same lies for the rest of the population, right? I mean, you got just people who want to go, you know, kill every human being in Libya and people who want to bomb Libya because we care about them and you know and 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 yet it's always it's always the humanitarian war that didn't happen right it's always we must bomb Libya because Rwanda where a lot of different things should have been done even in the preceding years in which militarism created that but not bombing and then they get to Syria and they say well now we must bomb Syria not because Libya I mean, Samantha Power wrote an essay on how, why you should ignore Libya as part of your duty as a citizen to be properly prepared for bombing Syria. It's, we must bomb Syria because Rwanda, right? So they, every nation-building war has not built a nation. Every humanitarian war has not benefited humanity. You know, and, and, and if you start, there's, I mean, there's only a half dozen themes, and, and the types of lies are very repetitive. And, you know, and they're from the very blatant, you know, Kuwait paying a PR firm to train the, the ambassador's daughter to tell Congress that Iraqis took babies out of incubators and left them on the floor and this sort of thing to, to much more subtle uh, assumptions that are built into everything that's fed to us. But the, the lies are, are, are fit a pattern. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun and they're using the same types of lies Bush used the same types of lies that each of his predecessors used, the, the lies that Wilson told about ships being innocently attacked even though they were helping the British were the same lies that FDR told about other ships. You know, the, Obama's lies about the chemical weapons in Syria that we touched on, but also about the, uh, the looming massacre in Libya and handing out Viagra to the troops for mass rape and all of that about Gaddafi because he'd fallen out of favor. The, the 
other lies about Syria, the rescue on the mountaintop with, with ISIS, the lies about the success of the Iraq surge that Obama immediately carried over to Afghanistan to triple the number of troops in Afghanistan. You know, they, they all follow a pattern. So what if we were prepared? What if we had studied the types of lies and examples of each type and looked at the sort of activism that can be done about it, uh, and we had this in our heads so that the next time they pitched a war, we could say hell no immediately, not when it was too late. Because even when you got a majority saying never should have started that war, it's not a majority saying you should end it. Once you got the war going, you must continue it for the benefit of the troops, right? You must support the troops by killing more troops. So it, you know, you did not have a majority saying end it. Uh, you had all, you sometimes had a majority saying, "I wish it would end in the next couple of years," you know. But you didn't have you even had the troops themselves saying, "We want it ended this year." But you didn't have to support that, you know. You had to support killing more troops. Uh, so, what if we could? It's much easier to prevent it, but to prevent it. It has to be made a public question and put before us. And this is part of what was different about Syria 2013. It was made into a public question, put before the public, put before the Congress, put before the media, war or no war. This is also the advantage we had on the Iran nuclear agreement, where people's work also succeeded and where we actually had a section of the government on our side. I mean, the better model for us to study is 2013, where both big political parties were against us. Uh, but you know, with the drone wars, with the quiet wars, with the special forces wars, when it's when we're never asked, we never have the initiative and the communications ability to say. Uh, and so, you know, we can say the special forces are different and they're very, very special. They're bigger than the entire military of most other nations. They're in some 75 nations. There are. 130 by some counts. Uh, they, you know, and we have. If you watch the the Golden State Warriors game tonight, they may thank the troops for watching in 175 nations, which is you know where they admit U.S. troops are, uh, and and look at which ones are not in that list. They are the looming dangers to the world. Uh, but we now have, we now have seven significant U.S. wars underway. Almost nobody can, I'm sure somebody in this room can, but almost nobody in this country can name all seven. Everybody thinks some of them are justified, some of them aren't, but they can't even name them. And five of them now have ground troops. I don't care if you, how special you call them, they're ground troops killing and dying on the ground. Uh, and, and this is in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Iraq and Syria, and in Yemen. And all of those are perfectly primed for massive escalation by perhaps the next administration, perhaps this one. And Congress has just put through a, a military funding bill where they have intentionally planned on taking the money from the war, the slush fund for wars, and dumping it into some of their favorite weapons for some of their favorite campaign bribers with the plan that the money for wars will run out in April and there will be a new bill for a lot more money for wars. Y you know, you can't, you can't have more wars than you can keep track of. You can't have drone wars that you celebrate because they're better than ground wars, and in drone wars, nobody gets killed, and so forth, and then escalate it predictably into a ground war and leave that waiting to be escalated while antagonizing Russia in a manner we haven't seen in decades, and China, and so forth, uh, and make a nice speech in Hiroshima where you tell everybody war is permanent, war is unavoidable, we won't get rid of it for decades, while escalating the, the creation of new nuclear weapons and making small ones that you call more usable and putting more nukes into Europe and fear-mongering around Iran's non-existent nuclear weapons program and antagonizing Russia and China and eliminating fewer nukes than Bush did or any previous president. Uh, you know, this, this has the potential for further disaster under this president or whoever is the next one. And, and I will just say briefly on the election topic, I agree with the late, great Howard Zinn that it matters a lot less who is sitting in the White House than is who is doing the sit-ins about what is happening in the White House, and which is, which is not the same as saying it doesn't matter at all. It is, the, it is saying what I said, that it matters less, that it matters more 
that we educate, that we organize, that we mobilize, that we bring public pressure, that we change our culture, that we that as the as the gay rights movement has made it possible for corporations to boycott states that are discriminating against gay people, it wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. Make it possible for organizations and corporations to turn against war, to turn against war profiteering. Make that possible in our culture. I mean, this is what's going to be needed, regardless of, of who is the president. Um, and yes, compared to Hillary or Trump, Bernie is the coming of the age of Aquarius. But on a global standard of political leaders, I mean, he is a crazed warmonger, right? I mean, it, it's relative to your, where, you're, where you're looking from. Uh, and I think what Bernie has accomplished, which is absolutely tremendous uh, and is, is going to be more important than whether he wins the White House or not, uh, is that he has mobilized millions of people to tell the corporate media to go to hell and to refuse their instructions. And I predicted this would not happen, and it happened. Uh, and I was completely wrong. Uh, the, and this is absolutely unprecedented. Never before has the corporate media whited out and slandered and libeled a candidate and had this kind of support for that candidate anyway. Right Now, Bernie's accomplishment is not getting Hillary to pretend she agrees with half his platform. You know, who cares? This is his accomplishment. And our ability to resist the media on other matters, on war lies, on every issue under the sun is going to matter a heck of a lot more. But I think you know part of what Bernie has had up against him from the start has been this unprecedented lumping of the so-called superdelegates in with the other delegates to pretend Hillary was winning before anything began, and now to pretend that she's already won. If this were compressed into a day, if it were election night, and they were saying it's over, when it wasn't, so and Californians weren't going to turn out to vote, people would be spitting mad. Because they've stretched it out over months and pretended superdelegates are real delegates, they're telling Californians not to bother voting. And it's a blatant lie, but every media outlet is in on it. Every single media outlet tells you that you know Hillary has won, or it's impossible for Hillary not to win, or she's virtually won, and so forth. You know, the the more they keep saying it, the more True it is, because despite this unprecedented resistance, people still do obey their televisions. <laughs> they do, you know. If I, if I were, you know, if I were to tell you that Oklahoma City has beaten Golden State, you know, people might get mad because they thought I was making the wrong prediction. But it wouldn't be influencing an important public process or even a sporting event because the basketball players do whatever the hell they want anyway. They're not going to obey what I say on television. But with voters, you can't do that. It's toxic. It's, it's abusive. Uh, and it is not just the media. It is the Democratic Party uh, and the completely unprofessional, uh, bought off and paid for, biased, fraudulent, criminal chairwoman of the Democratic Party. How, how, how uh, what am I going to learn now from your new edition that I missed in your excellent old edition? Well, we may have hit on some of it, but the new edition looks at the past five or six years. Uh, and, you know, it, it, I could take the old edition to a Democratic Party club and talk about Bush's wars, and they all agree with me. The new edition, unfortunately, the wars have continued and the lies have continued. And the normalization of war has expanded. So that we now have a candidate in a debate asked, will you kill thousands of innocent children as part of your basic duties? And there's no scandal. I don't know of any other country now or in the past where that could have been part of a public debate for elected office. Uh, we have more wars than we can count. Uh, we have wars without any pretense of involving Congress or the UN. Uh, we have assassinations out in the open. We have coups out in the open, Honduras, Ukraine, Brazil, I would include. Uh, we, have, uh, we have more money into the Department of So-Called Defense under this president than any previous president, which doesn't count a whole lot of other departments. Uh, we have more bases opening, more troops in more countries. 
in uh, 2013, after uh, Obama had, you know, as he says in his speeches, you know, moved to uh, putting war behind us and the age of peace arrived and made the United States uh, respected again. In 2013, December, there was a poll by Gallup in 65 countries that included this question, what country is the greatest threat to peace on earth? <laughs> Overwhelmingly in most of the countries. But in the United States, among people in the United States answering that question, who won? Russia, Russia, Russia. Who else? Iran. Iran is the correct answer. Uh, and Iran spends less than 1% what the United States does on militarism. Iran does not have a drone assassination program. Iran does not have a prison in Guantanamo. Iran has literally not attacked another nation in centuries. Iran is the only nation attacked that I know of with major chemical weapons attacks that refused as a matter of principle, not ability, but principle, to respond in kind. Uh, and in the minds of people with television sets in the United States, <laughs> Iran is the greatest threat to peace on earth. This is a weakness. So I touch on some of the encouraging bits, but I find perhaps more encouraging than others. 2013 Syria, 2015 nuclear agreement. But those videos in 2014 of white people who spoke English having their necks cut with a knife which is far more dangerous to peace on earth than nuclear weapons or tanks or missiles or anything, you know, a knife. Uh, the irrationality of that fear that drove millions of people to say, okay, go ahead, start a war. Start a war on the opposite side of where we had the moral responsibility to start the war last year. In fact, go ahead and start it on both sides. In fact, let's have armed and trained CIA troops fighting armed and trained Pentagon troops which we now have in Syria. Let me just do what you want, because there were videos of white people being killed with knives. That fear, right? There are more Americans by far killed by toddlers with guns than by foreign terrorists with any weapons, right? And we don't think of toddlers as inherently backwardly evil because they have the wrong religion and the wrong skin color. But where do you think the majority of weapons in the Middle East, the region that we call the Middle East, where do you think the majority of the weapons are made? Right. right. Most people don't know that. Right. And so I, I think the lies about the entire enterprise of being the weapons seller to the world uh, and waiving restrictions on selling weapons to brutal dictatorships if they've donated to your and your husband's family foundation in the millions, and you happen to be Secretary of State at the time, th th this level of corruption has grown. Uh, and the basic underlying lies have grown. Uh, and so the, the reason that, uh, that I've been part of starting a new organization called World Beyond War, uh, and, and I want to actually ask David Hartso, who started this organization with me to pass around this clipboard. <laughs> Ask if you could pass around that clipboard with something to write up. Uh, people, tens of thousands of people in 130, maybe 140 countries now, not the Pentagon's 175, but approaching it, have signed a short statement that's at the top of this clipboard that says, I want to help eliminate all war. Uh, and the reason that we've started this up is because even when we have fewer deaths or fewer wars or we eliminate one weapon or we you know, have a movement that pushes back against a bombing campaign and they have to go with the arming and training of proxies instead, which we were even more against in the polls, but we didn't have the activism and the big public question against. You know, even with you know, some of these positive things, you still have a president who gave the first ever pro-war Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, go to Hiroshima and tell us, I'd like to eliminate nuclear weapons, but war has been with us since the arising of the first man. And I, in the statement he, said, he has on the White House that he made in some other location in Japan, he, I'd, I'd like to see a world in which it weren't necessary to build nuclear weapons. Here it is, Mr. President. This is it. This world right here is not some other world. It's not some world your grandkids might see if you don't kill us all first. It's here right now. 
War has not been with us since the first man, woman, or child. It, I mean, the, the anthropology, I mean, there's still a controversy as on climate change, but the anthropologists who look at the matter in a serious way, war did not exist in a serious way among hunter-gatherers who could run away, who didn't have to fight wars and didn't, right? I mean, when I jogged through the park up by the Golden Gate Bridge, it said, this morning it said, if you see a coyote, make a loud noise and it'll run away. This is what people used to do, right? <laughs> I mean, those, the, when, man the warrior in the Natural History Museum in the 1950s with the marks on the bones, those were not wounds of war. Those were, those were wounds of teeth. We were dinner. We weren't man the warrior. And war has been sporadic through human history since the big concentration in cities. Uh, you've had entire civilizations without it. You've had entire civilizations do away with it for centuries. You have countries now with no military, with their military in museums. Uh, you have 90% of humanity at least represented by governments putting dramatically less into militarism than the United States does. You have 99% of people in the war-making country of the world not participating in the US military. 44% of Americans say to pollsters, I would participate in a war if there were one. We have more wars we can keep track of. They don't want to participate in a war. They want to think of themselves as participating in a war. And by the way, a lot of other countries are down to 10% on that, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, but the number one killer of, for, of participants, U.S. participants in this inevitable, natural, human nature exercise is suicide. The number of cases thus far discovered of PTSD from war deprivation is zero. Right? It's not natural. It's not inevitable. It's not in our genes. As President Obama even came around to saying after telling this, this misleading story, it's not in our genes. We can choose to do away with it. And we can choose to talk about ending particular wars as, as steps toward dramatic de-escalation, down to actual defense, down to what Smedley Butler said, keep the US military within 200 miles of the US. There goes a majority of the US military. There goes weapons systems that have no defensive purpose, right? And then watch the arms race go in the right direction among the other nations. And then see what we can do about eliminating the entire enterprise and doing something better. Because what weapon, what weapon kills the most now, today? Uh, yeah, somebody said cars, which in fact you know, kills more Americans than foreign terrorists. But the US military kills primarily by taking the money from useful places. And when you have an Air Force official tell the Smithsonian Magazine last month, we, could, we have technology to drop food in Syria accurately, where people would actually find it and not go on starving, but it costs $60,000, we would never use it for a merely humanitarian operation. And each missile is $1.4 million, right? And we could end starvation and give clean drinking water to everyone and green energy and medicine and education. Uh, we could transform this country and the world, we don't have to choose which, for a fraction of what we're dumping into this criminal enterprise on the suspicion that there might be a good war next year, that there might be a justifiable, necessary war next, next time, when the wars are counterproductive, when the wars are creating the danger, when you know, it would take years for Canada or some other country to create anti-Canadian terrorist networks on a US scale. I mean, it would take occupation after bombing after occupation to do it. Well, then we need to move the money where it's, where it's useful and out of this criminal enterprise. Uh, and we can't do that just by saying we should have smart wars instead of dumb wars. We should have drone wars instead of human wars. We have to say we're not going to have wars. Sure. Okay. Those who have a question for David. Um, or, or Dan, if or Dan, Dan wants to. Absolutely. If you'd care to answer some from the audience, I'd probably be glad to bring you a microphone. 
what do you do about ISIS? That wasn't mentioned, and it's the unorganized threat that I'm more concerned about than the organized national ones. Yeah, what do you do about ISIS? The two answers, one involves owning a time machine. You don't create it in the first place. You don't destroy Iraq, you don't destroy Libya, you don't arm the region to the teeth, you don't give Iraq and Libya weapons that end up in the hands of ISIS, you don't arm terrorist and, and so-called moderate mass murdering groups in Syria that then pass the weapons along to ISIS. You don't intentionally and accidentally drop weapons on ISIS itself. You, 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 you stop everything that created the problem in the first place. And when ISIS comes into it, and you don't, as Hillary Clinton still says Obama was wrong not to bomb every inch of Syria in 2013, which probably would have put ISIS in charge. You don't do that. And you don't ask for a no-fly zone on the theory that someday ISIS might develop the airplane, right? You, you, you know, you, which is a, a, a criminal, mass, murderous military operation, a no-fly zone. You can call it a safety zone. You can call it a women's right to be president zone. It's, it's a murderous operation of war to bomb major uh, facilities in Syria and bomb anything that's in the sky. And you don't give anti-aircraft weaponry to fighters on the ground, ISIS or otherwise, and wait and see which Western airplane or Russian airplane, civilian or otherwise, gets shot down. Who remembers, and I'll give you the second part, which is what you really want in one second, but the the who remembers what George W. Bush told Tony Blair on January 31st, 2003 in the White House before they walked out and did a press conference about how they were hoping to avoid war with Iraq? He said, one of the ways we could start a war with Iraq would be to paint some planes with United Nations colors and fly them low and try to get them shot at. What do you think is going to happen if they if they give more? They've already given some, but give more anti-aircraft weaponry uh, to fighters on the ground in Syria. Uh, anyway, you you what you do about ISIS, you, you know, you don't do what they want when they put out videos saying, please attack us. You don't, you don't then attack them only from the air. I mean, Rachel Maddow was, was you know, just ecstatic about the wisdom and goodness of giving ISIS only their second choice in the world. You know, they, they really wanted a U.S. ground war. We'll just attack them from the air and see if their recruitment soars with that. And it did. Uh, so you don't do that. The first thing you do is extend the ceasefire and begin accepting negotiations with people who don't all swear that Assad must leave by Tuesday before they start the negotiations. The United States has been tearing apart peace efforts from the UN and Africa and the region and Russia for years and years. And the Russia, now the, the former Nobel laureate from Finland says that in 2012, Russia offered a peace settlement that would have evol involved Assad uh, stepping down, and the U.S. waved it off because they were so sure Assad was about to be violently overthrown. Now, we all know that violent overthrows have worse results than nonviolent ones, and any success lasts much less uh, of a time. Why would they have preferred a violent overthrow and deluded themselves it was imminent, as they did year after year, uh, to a nonviolent offer of, of an actual guaranteed process that was going to involve him stepping down because they want Russia out of there because they want control of Syria and Iran's next right and, and, and so you open negotiations without preconditions and then you pursue disarmament uh, and, and that includes cutting off arms and fighters uh, for ISIS from US allies from vicious, brutal U.S. allies uh, in the Gulf and from Turkey and elsewhere, uh, and, and you start a campaign for disarmament. You know, three quarters of the disarmament is done with one country on board, the United States. You, then you use the considerable U.S. pressure to get other countries on board. You pursue disarmament, and then you pursue actual aid, actual humanitarian aid, which it may cost $60,000 to do something, but compared to tens of billions, I think we can afford it. And it makes this country loved in the process rather than hated. You pursue actual humanitarian aid. Uh, and 
do you talk to ISIS even though they're irrational subhuman monsters you can't talk to? Yes, you do. Uh, and, and you talk to people who are living under their brutal rule, who go along with them because of where they live. You know, this is when the United States went into Afghanistan uh, and people who had supported the Taliban because they had to, because of where they lived, and then switched and supported the U.S. because now they had to because of where they live. The U.S. said, and you know, anyone with a with a drop of blood of ever having supported the bad people, you know, is out. They're our enemy forever. You know, this is a, in Iraq, two thousand and three, after the occupation. Anyone who was ever part of Hussein's government because they needed a job, they're our enemy. They're out. We're, we're disbanding the military and everybody else. You know, this is this is a sort of cartoonish thinking that doesn't work in the real world. Uh, and, and so we we stop thinking of of ISIS as somehow worse than, uh, you know, the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany or attacks from Mars. And we put it in context and, you know, deal with it in a serious way. Thank you. Um what, what you talked about sounds a lot to me like um, the movement for economic conversion in the 70s, which was a great movement until we declared that the peace dividend had been spent some other way. So I have, I have quest one question for you and one for Mr. Ellsberg. Um, how do we prevent the media from profiting by dr dramatizing con confrontations of any kind, especially war, I mean, or if it's Trump versus whoever, um, the media profits from, uh, from conflict. So this is one big thing, and consolidation of media have made it even worse, although we have wonderful internet resources of all kind. Um, how do we prevent corporations from the entrenched uh, corporations from continuing to profit from the war that they perpetuate and produce for and get money from the military budget for. We try to do this with economic conversion to peacetime uses. You know, who's the we here? And for Mr. Ellsberg, I wonder if you think that the mass movement in the 60s um, was largely uh, fed by the draft at the time, the military draft, and paradoxically, is a draft what really makes people drop what they're doing, uh, stop worrying about their own problems, and fight for their lives. You want to go first, or me? Go ahead. Um, I, I, after Dan speaks on the draft, I want to say something about the draft as well. With he and I were talking about it earlier, but you, you go ahead on that too. Uh, okay, well, I'll go first, and then Dan uh, will give you the correct answer. Um, the <laughs> the, uh, the the media uh, Dan will give you the, the the better informed answer. I'm not kidding. Uh, the, the the media, you know, it, it, it is absolutely essential to these wars. Couldn't happen without. The media, uh, and I think one thing we have to do, and this is the point of my book, is is sort of mental reform. Get our heads straight so that we don't fall for what the media pushes on us, and push back, and push back hard, and immediately, and take our protests to the headquarters of the media as the promoters of the war. Um, I, I think the second thing we have to do is build independent media and use it. Throw your television out. Don't own it, uh, don't have anything to do with it, but use independent media, international media, that means whatever country you live in, get your news about that country from all the other countries, uh, and, and online media and independent radio and good, reliable, investigative outlets, new forms of which uh, are arising. You know, beyond that, we should be pushing for uh, you know, structural reforms to the corporate media, but I think that comes at the bottom of the list. Uh, I, you know, war profiteering is something that we have to make shameful in our culture. Uh, and it was almost done away with back in the 30s and almost nationalized, you know, but we need to, we need to make it shameful. And as the movement builds up for boycott divestment and sanctions around weapons for Israel and, and Israeli war crimes, and this is where young people are leading the way in the, in the peace movement is against Israeli wars. Expand that to all wars, including U.S. wars, and all weapons for all wars, including U.S. <laughs> weapons. Um, I, 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 think, uh, I, I think 
that economic conversion is still where it's at. Uh, it had, you know, it, there was a bill that was doing very well right before they killed Kennedy, and there was a bill that was doing very well right at the end of the so-called end of the Cold War uh, that uh, Congressman Newt Gingrich, uh, Republican from Lockheed Martin, led the fight that killed. Uh, and, and and it did it viciously and uh, and with attacks on the uh, Democrats in the Congress at the time. Uh, but it 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 still makes absolute perfect sense. And the books that Seymour Melman used to write and the bills that used to be drafted are still sitting around to be reintroduced. Uh, and it can be done at the at the national, state, or local level. And it doesn't involve hurting anybody other than CEO salaries. The savings are so immense that you can retool and retrain and create a safety net and nobody has to suffer. The idea that wars are economically beneficial, which you'll hear Congress members say, which sounds sociopathic to 96% of humanity that hears it, isn't true. It isn't true, even on economic terms. And when there was a scare a few years back that the military was going to be slashed, which also wasn't true, uh, you had states and localities start to set up commissions to work on economic conversion. You know, and Connecticut set up a big commission with labor and environment and management. Are you from Connecticut? Yeah. So, but then the scare went away and everybody realized the military wasn't being cut. Uh, and so how do we do it without the scare? How do we do it just for the economic benefits or the moral and civil liberties and environmental and humanitarian benefits uh, that continue to exist? And you can do it at the local level and you can go to your city council and tell them they can get money from a federal government program to work on economic conversion. And you can go to a think tank in, the, in Washington, D.C. called the Institute for Policy Studies, IPS, and to a staffer there named Miriam Pemberton and say, help us do this. And go to your city council, instead of saying, we want money for something, say, here's money for you for something that you, whether you can scare them into thinking they're going to have to do it sooner or later, I don't know. But can you give them all the rationales that will move them and stay silent on the ones that won't and get them to act? I don't know. Um, I, 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 I'll turn it over to Dan, but I just want to note on the draft, you know, that an amendment was just killed uh, to add women to the selective service, to require, to mandate that any female now as well as male who turns 18 has to go register for the draft. Uh, no option of conscientious objection or any uh, alternative service or anything. And it was killed not by every good progressive Democrat who were for it down to the man and woman. I don't know of any exceptions. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. It was killed by right-wing Republicans who get their ideas on women's rights from the Bible and do not want women taking part in a man's business. And they were right for the wrong reasons, <laughs> right? And, and, and yet, and, and all the good liberal progressives wanted to cut out what they called discrimination against women, force women into any draft to stop discriminating against them. This is the mindset among the progressive activists. But among the peace activists, we need a draft because then we can have a bigger peace movement. Well, you know, it didn't work for the Civil War, it didn't work for World War I, it didn't work for World War II, and it worked for Vietnam after six million human beings in Southeast Asia lay dead. And we haven't had a war that came close, at least in immediate short-term impact to that, since the ending of the draft. And if we have a war in this day and age, when they're against a draft and they're making robots that can kill, that requires a draft, Oh my God, what a war it's going to be. It's going to be a war that probably none of us survive. An anti-war movement should take away tools of war, not ad advance them to progressive gender-balanced status. <laughs> and when people tell you, when people tell you you must go hold your nose and vote for one of the lesser evil candidates, I don't even know which it is at this point, and lesser evilism has taken us, you know, you get to a pair of more evil candidates each cycle than the worst one the time before. It's not sustainable. At some point, enough is enough. But the people who tell you, you must go and hold your nose and vote either for a lesser evil candidate or for somebody, but you must vote because people suffered and bled and died for the right to vote. Well, that's a reason to keep working to try to have an open, fair, verifiable election someday in the United States. But people bled and died to end the draft. 
And Bernie's hero got a million votes for president from a prison in Atlanta where he was sitting because he spoke against the draft. If you're going to honor noble causes because people bled and died for them, well, that's the draft. We got to eliminate it. And there is legislation in Congress to eliminate it, which doesn't discriminate against anybody. It eliminates it for everybody. This is what we need. And we need a treaty, a global treaty, no conscription of anybody. That's what we need. Go ahead, another question. He, he said it. He speaks for me on the draft here. Yeah. Next okay. question. Bernie inspires me. Bernie Sanders inspires me because of his passion to improve the country for the mass, for, for the majority of people. Uh, one of the things he talks about is um, that the other side thinks is radical is free education uh, in, in, in state and public universities. Well, Governor Brown, when he went to Cal Berkeley, it was virtually free. Uh, and most, if not all, advanced wealthy countries in the world offer virtually free education. Here where it costs thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year to go to school, even in a public university. You know, how can we be globally competitive? So Bernie's talking about free education. Everyone else is saying it's radical, but it, it was it was part of this country, and we brought that idea to other countries. So Michael Moore just did a movie, and I just saw it at the uh, Universalist uh, Unitarian Church. They had a screening. of uh, It's called Where to Invade Next. And he talks about all these ideas that started here and other countries ran with, for, for example, high-speed trains and... Um, and um, uh, free education and and you and, and, and pu public health care care for all. So these are the countries in the world that are spending virtually nothing on it defense as we are. They're putting it into high speed trains, so it, we've got a good infrastructure. They're putting it into healthcare systems, so it's a a right, not a privilege. And they're putting it into free education, so their their population can be globally competitive. If we simply did that, you have a question. So, so, the, so the question is, it, what, what, all the other candidates, including Hillary are wanting to be in war. Bernie says no war, uh, but it doesn't seem like he's fighting for it as much as I'd like him to. Should I tell you? Um, well, I'll, I'll say something to that. I think it is very relevant to the topic. And Dan, if you want to say something, uh, you should. Uh, Bernie, of course, does not say no war. I wish he did. You know, compared to Hillary and Trump, he's wonderful on war. On domestic issues, he really is fantastically wonderful. Um, but to separate the two and to continue dumping a trillion dollars a year into preparations for war that make wars happen rather than preventing wars and expect to have money for everything else. Well, this is what forces Bernie into you know, these complicated explanations of how he's raising your taxes but not raising your taxes, which absolutely make total sense once you look at them. And we can take money from billionaires or from the military. There's money aplenty in both reserves. Uh, but if Bernie didn't want all of these accusations of raising taxes that have been hurting him, all he would have had to say was, we're going to pinch a little fraction out of military spending to pay for this stuff. He refused to say that. He used to. Years ago, he used to say, cut it in half, right? And that was before it doubled, you know? He could, you know? Uh, but he won't, he, he won't say that, um, you know? And uh, again, he's, he, he, what he will say that the Pentagon can't stand, that is, you know, feared worse than, you know, than... The, the coming of, of permanent peace by the Pentagon is free college because every effort by all these great counter recruitment groups to, to get the tests out of the schools, to stand next to the table of pro-war veterans with your anti-war veterans, all of this wonderful work doesn't begin to compare to what free college would do to military recruitment. I mean, it would just be devastated, mm. absolutely devastated. Mm. And, and the counter recruiters know this and they, uh, and they agree with this. Um, and, and it ought to be possible, it, you know, we're, it's a work in progress, but this idea that you can only motivate young people uh, to oppose a war if you have a draft, I don't know why you can't mobilize young people to oppose a war because then they wouldn't have to be $40,000 in debt. Right. And and they could go to co this is not just for college students. This is for the young people who can't go to college because they don't 
choose to be $40,000 in debt or don't have a way to make it happen. Uh, you know, that can mobilize young people if we work at it. I, I have no doubt whatsoever. Um, so absolutely go and see Michael Moore's movie if you haven't. Uh, it is all the things we could be doing. <laughs> if we weren't doing this with our money. And, and Noam Chomsky put out a new movie at the same time. If you want to be really depressed about how we got here, go watch that one. But if you want to be like, you know, laugh out loud, encouraged about all the things we don't dare dream of that we could do for a little fraction of the money we're dumping into this criminal enterprise, which Michael Moore, to his credit, says in the movie, What's you know. The title of Noam Chomsky's movie? Requiem for, the American dream. Requiem for the American Dream. Thank you to those who have memories. I didn't remember it. Uh, did you want Dan? Did you want to say something to that? Is that the name of his new movie? Uh, My, uh, Michael no, Moore's? Noam Chomsky's, not Michael Chomsky's, Moore's. Yeah, no. A footnote to the uh, the Michael Moore movie I was thinking of just now. I heard last week. My granddaughter just uh, graduated from Smith. And she had uh, written a highest honors thesis on She's a film, working on film on uh, French uh, treatment in media of um, the Holocaust. As a matter of fact, she'd interviewed Marcel Ophuls and others. And so she had won, uh, she had gotten admitted, she was very happy to hear just last week, to the Sorbonne for a year at the Sorbonne uh, on a uh, master's program on this. So I said, well, did she get a scholarship? No, no. I said, well, gee, how are you going to pay for that? I said, well, it's $70. For a year. Save up. <laughs> Euros. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Swanson. I look forward to reading your book. I haven't read it, but uh, in the definition of the war is a, a lie, is it the big lie that all war is death and destruction and an annihilation and that is always a noble cause where we're the soldier that God is with us and that might is right and to the victor belong the spoils of war and that the annihilation of total victory is the true achievement of peace. Um, it, it, will I find that working definition in your book? And then I have a question for Dr. Ellsberg. Um, since you're with us today, sir, could you give a brief comment about your experience of the the lie of the Vietnam War? I mean, and as a Vietnam veteran, I still ask why we were in Vietnam. And uh, as a former founding member of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, um, I would ask that we remember the 58,000 that died in Vietnam. I, I didn't hear that uh, so to th thank you for your questions. Uh, so he asked, he asked me something about the idea that war is a lie, and he asked you about your experience with lies about the Vietnam War. Uh, he wants us to remember 58,000 dead, and I want us to remember 6,058,000 dead. Uh, but I think, you know, this is, this is Memorial Day weekend, and this is a time to remember everyone who has died in these wars, the majority of whom have been on the weaker side that's attacked, the majority of whom have been civilians, but many, many of whom have been U.S. soldiers and their families have suffered horribly. And their kids are born with the deformities of the toxins they're exposed to, and their lives are destroyed with the deformities of the war culture and the missing parents. Um, thank you, by the way, for being part of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. I, I just... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just did a series of events in cities in Florida and stayed at Scott Camille's house, who was one of the Gainesville 8 and Winter Soldier testifiers and who has been working like many of these 
Vietnam veterans against war ever since, uh, which has been the, the core of our of our peace movement uh, and has been absolutely tremendous. Uh, I, I don't know what I, 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 I suspect we're going to get uh, yanked off uh, stage fairly soon and I'm going to sign books and I want to give this to Dan. But, uh, you know, war, the, 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 the basic idea of war is a lie is is that everything the governments tell us about wars to get them started, to keep them going, to escalate them, is a lie. And it's not that wars don't exist. It's not that there aren't lots of truths we can discuss about wars. Uh, it, it's that our basic understanding that, that a war can be good, that some wars are bad, that maybe every war I can think of for the past 71 years has been bad, but there can be a good one, and there might be another good one is out of place in a world that doesn't say there might be a just rape. It doesn't come up with Geneva conventions for slavery, for how to do it properly. That there are, that there are evil things we recognize as evil, and the idea that they aren't, the idea that they're good or justified or noble or glorious or heroic is actually a lie. Uh, and war is the worst thing climate destruction in which war is the leading component is a close rival at this point, if not passing it. But war is at the top of the list of the worst things we do to ourselves. Uh, and anything that leads you to think otherwise, including most uh, US movies and entertainment and so forth, is a lie. I, I want to talk about the war at home. Can you let Dan Ellsberg answer his question first? Oh, go ahead. Is that Mitty? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I want to talk about the war at home and the increased militarization of the police and the resulting in consequential uh, killing of black and brown people in this country and how the U.S. military contractors uh, uh, contribute to that. Could you make the, re the relationship between the U.S. wars abroad and what is happening here with military grade uh, technology being appropriated to the cities, including San Francisco and the neighboring regions through Urban Shield. Yeah. Do you, do you want to do that one or do you want to do the last one Take about that. Vietnam? I'll, I'll get back to the other one. Okay. I, we might need to make this the last question because we were told to, to go an hour and a half and then we'll still be here and I'll sign books and we'll talk less formally. But uh, but to speak to this, it is it is one of the many ways that the wars come home. You know, when the rights are stripped from foreigners, they're stripped from Americans. When it becomes okay to assassinate other people, it becomes okay to assassinate Americans. It's also part of the profit business uh, of arms dealing uh, in which the United States is the leader, and most of which arms are not for the U.S. military. They're for all sorts of dictatorships and democracies abroad. One way to get more money for more weapons is to give the old weapons to local police departments. Many are given free, some are sold. And then it also becomes possible to get jobs and to advance bureaucracies and so-called homeland, so-called security departments by, by training police departments to think of protesters as what they call low-grade terrorists. I mean, some of these police officers who were attacking citizens in Baltimore for exercising their First Amendment rights have been trained in Israel by the Israeli military in how to deal with Palestinians and to think of Baltimoreans in the way that the Israeli military thinks about Palestinians. I mean, this is an incredibly toxic effect on U.S. culture uh, that, that comes, you know, you're going to have militarized cities as long as you have a militarized government uh, and you're going to have weapons profiteers, you know, marketing their weapons everywhere as long as that's immensely profitable and tolerated. I saw that California has now passed a bill waiting for a signature unless he signed it already uh, that's going to criminalize boycott, divestment and sanction by any business in California of any foreign government that the United States recognizes. Well, you know, this is, this is, I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever if we were enforcing basic laws and treaties on weapons, because it is already theoretically illegal for a weapons company in California to be doing business with numerous nations that the United States recognizes, but it recognizes as gross human rights abusers 
uh, and, and therefore not at the level that they can be given weapons for mass murder, which you only give to nations that commit mass murder without abusing human rights. If you can make any sense of that. So, you know, I, I, th I think all of this infiltration of our culture with the idea that war is okay and that racism is okay and that if a good liberal peace laureate can bomb seven Muslim countries, there might be something wrong with the Muslim down the street. All of this is, is toxic and it starts from the top uh, and we can deal with it from all sorts of levels, but a lot of them are going after the symptoms and the root cause is militarism and military spending and the war machine rolling on and on on a fraudulent basis constructed of lies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, we need time for you to sign some books here. I think okay. I'm, <laughs> we need to uh, give you that time. Sure. I, uh, I, I, I'm sorry? Dan, do you want to speak about Vietnam and I'll go... Sign books? Oh, are there any wars? <laughs> well, okay, I'll, uh, I'll say where there's, yeah, go ahead, that's fine. Um, okay, I've, uh, actually Dave mentioned some of the very specific lies that I came in on, in effect, on uh, Tonkin Gulf specifically, you know, that justified supposedly attack, attack on our ship that supposedly justified an act of self-defense. But the larger involvement which I think required a draft. And so to get back to an earlier question here, uh, despite the fact that the draft did account for large rallies, it also was essential to a large war. And I think that uh, if we got the draft back, in other words, if we started drafting people in addition, we'd have a much larger military. And I believe that we would, uh, dangerous and wrongful as it is for us to be operating with special forces in many, many countries around the world. If we were operating with brigades and divisions, as I believe we will be under a, under a Republican, and Hillary must be subjected to uh, tremendous public pressure, I think, to keep her from, from doing it, uh, but I think we would already be there with a Republican over the last uh, eight years. Uh, then what will go with that is a hell of a lot more bombing than you've seen yet. Uh, what the, with the American troops will come bombing of the local country on a vastly greater scale and much more greater, bad as the drones are, killing perhaps 17 uh, unidentified or innocent or non-combatant people for every so-called terrorist they get. Uh, the fact is that the overall scale would be enormously greater if we do what, in fact, the Republicans have promised to do, and that is to send both heavy bombers, uh, that is bombing, into Syria and ground troops and Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I think this we're going to have to work very hard to keep this from being in our future. And a draft, I'm afraid, would, would facilitate that. Uh, that's one lesson from Vietnam. But the biggest one, I think, of general was uh, it facilitated the lies that were told and the truths that were not told uh, were lies to ourselves to a very large extent uh, about our own self-image as a nation, who we are, as Obama said in Hiroshima yesterday, who we are and who we might be. Who we have been for quite a while is an empire, a, a country, a major country that uses its covert operations in particular uh, its finances in various ways, but also many uh, covert operations and, when necessary, overt operations, as in Vietnam and Iraq, where the covert operations didn't suffice to get us a government that would bend to our interests or our policies. Uh, we then decide to regime, change that regime by force, either by covert means or by force. I think we're, uh, in the whole, we have been could be called a covert empire in the sense that we rely so much on assassination, bribes, paramilitary, uh, infiltration or influence of the armed forces for coups and so forth. But again, at times not so covert as in Iraq and as in Vietnam. So we were acting, in other words, determined by force the who should govern and who should die in a foreign country uh, as if it were a satrapy of some sort of ours, a satellite of ours, that uh, where we had a right to determine who that was. That prevented us from recognizing the motives 
and lied about the motives of the people who were fighting us, the people we were killing to a large extent along with a lot of non-combatants. And that remained true in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in other countries. Namely, these were people who were fighting foreign invaders and had done it before and were doing it to us as in Vietnam. They had done it to the French, the Japanese, the Chinese. The motives were essentially the same and they weren't about to be beaten by us either. Uh, we could, uh, uh, they could prevent us from, uh, uh, we couldn't beat them and uh, they couldn't beat us so militarily. They could keep the war going but we were not about to beat them. That was also true in Afghanistan. We were unable to see ourselves in the role of the Soviet invaders of Afghanistan or the British invaders the century before or Alexander or Genghis Khan or all the others. We, all, we, we prefer to think of ourselves as friends, brothers, uh, kindly uh, aiders of various people, not as attempting to install proxy governments. And uh, it's time for us, I think, to, uh, to take those blinders from our eyes, in effect, and see that uh, on the one hand we have no right to determine by force and fire and by killing or dying in those countries who shall govern them. And we have no prospect of doing it successfully uh, without enormous devastation. We do need a change. When actually, I've, I've only read the first half of the excerpts of Obama's speech. Um, in the New York Times uh, just before we came in. And I was thinking that as rhetoric, uh, uh, it's very, very good what I read first. It, it could almost have been written by Martin Luther King, uh, seriously. And yet, of course, the irony, the irony that it's, 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 uh, it's written or it's, it's spoken by a man who is buying a trillion dollars worth of new nuclear arms is almost unbearable. And you do have to say, is it good for him to be saying these things when he's at all when he's doing the opposite? Uh, hard for me to say so. But he did say we need a moral revolution. And that is one of the kinds of revolution we need. They should be nonviolent. And it does have to be. He's right, as, uh, as Bernie is saying. And that in ways means a revolution, a nonviolent revolution against empire, American empire, against being an imperial country as we have been for a long time and are today. We will have to change that. We cannot ask a president, man or woman, who has been elected to run an empire, as all of our presidents have been for uh, a long time here, and expect that person to uh, lead a revolution against uh, his or her own status and her own role. So we're going to have to make totally different demands. And going back to uh, the other question about Vietnam, I would say, well, okay, it's, it's, it's the same point there. That's what we should have learned and, uh, and haven't. And we still think of ourselves as a uh, universal force for good, peace, and democracy, which has never been true in the third world at all. That is a major delusion uh, and is, is not true now. But if it doesn't become true, then another thing that Obama said uh, yesterday is also true. The other path lies universal extinction. Uh, so uh, leadership is needed, he said, uh, American and others, and it's not going to come from an American president. It's got to be forced on them. Thank you.